Okay, it's loading. Hafezi and welcome to the Menyetlani Mensitigi uh, open mic. Guahusi uh, Victoria Lola Leon Guerrero, and I am the managing editor of the University of Guam Press. Um, UOG Press works to advance regional scholarship, develop cultural literacy, and expand accessibility to knowledge about Micronesia by providing high quality peer reviewed publishing services. Um, UOG Press has a wonderful collection of local literature, children's books, and academic publications, which you can always find on our website, uog.edu backslash UOG Press Dispensa. Uh, I should have that down. Um, but without further ado, I'd like to um, share a little bit about this evening and the wonderful people that uh, we can't wait to introduce to you. Um, UOG Press has spent the last year uh, of COVID in company with a community of writers that we call Menyetlun i Mentitsigi, uh, which literally translates into uh, siblings who write together. Um, so our Menyetlun i Mentitsigi Writers Fellowship actually began right before COVID started um, in about February. We started running uh, writing workshops every two weeks with a group of 18 writers. Um, this workshop program was part of a larger effort to provide um, support to a community of writers um, with a grant and generous support that we received from the Guam Economic Development Authority. On top of the writing workshops, we also hosted a four-day writing retreat uh, in the beautiful village of Malesu. Uh, we hosted what we called creative conversations where our writing um, Menyetlu met with um, and uh, had creative conversations with other published authors, uh, artists, and just uh, people who inspired us along the way. Um, and so I, before we dive right into the open mic, I'd like <clears throat> to make an awesome announcement. So also as part of this fellowship, we wanted to provide opportunities for for um, people who are interested in editing books or even just revisiting their own writing. Um, we're, we're offering an editing course in partnership with the UOG Division of English and Applied Linguistics. It begins next week on June 1st. It's called Issues in Writing, I mean, Issues in Editing Dispensa. And if you're interested in attending the course, it's only a $60 fee. Um, and you can please email us for the registration form at UOG press at triton.uog.edu. So again, if you're interested in taking a course in editing, um, they're going to cover, you know, issues with editing books, but like I said, also just the revision process in general, please email us. Um, I'd like to now introduce my co host this evening, uh, Dr. Michael Lujan Babakwa. So our fellowship coordinator is actually Akina Chargaloff, and she's really been the one who's kind of kept all of us organized and, and working together as this beautiful writing community. Community. Um, but uh, Maget and I have been supporting Akina as uh, workshop facilitators in our writing group. So Akina is a facilitator for her writing group. Um, and then both Maget and I um, have our own writing groups that we are so blessed to be part of. Um, all, all three of these groups have six writers. Uh, like I said, we meet every two weeks. And so Maget's going to tell you a little bit more about our program. Thank you, Masi Victoria. Thank you so much uh, for that. And I'm I'm so glad to be here with everybody. The Manyetluni, it is a little over one year since the start of this Manyetluni Mantitigi program. And um, it would be, and one thing that unfortunately came in the middle of our, our program was the COVID-19 pandemic. And so last, at the beginning of last year, three different writing groups started meeting in person, uh, in coffee shops, in restaurants, and then we locked down. And so each different writing group had to then adjust, sort of uh, adjust to the Zoom life, meet over Zoom, meet, find ways to meet virtually. But thankfully, all three writing groups, even as even uh, around uh, throughout the year, excuse me, kept meeting, kept sharing our work with each other. And in in one way, one thing that was nice about it, though, to have this creative outlet was that as some writing as some writers in these groups were struggling with issues in the pandemic family members that were sick, um, sort of having these 
dramatic changes in your life, some of them channeled it into their work, writing poetry or prose in which they were processing sort of these pandemic feelings, these quarantine feelings. And so it's, it's really nice to know that despite sort of all the changes that came this year, all three of these writing groups, they kept going, kept meeting. And then it's nice as sort of the, as at least the, the coronavirus cases have calmed down on island and we've opened up a little bit more. Some of our groups have started to meet in person again. I mean, my group, for example, we were, we've been meeting at Kings, like we're all high school students or something, staying up way too late. Um, you know, not wanting to go home, pretending what our, we're at our auntie's house when we're really at King's, hanging out, waiting for that crepe to show up. And so, but my group, we've been meeting at King's, hanging out, sharing our work. Um, and so uh, really UOG Press, by offering a program like this, it's, they're really sort of providing the nurturing and the support that, that our writers need. Guam is a place full of such incredible creatives people who have so much imagination, so much poetry in their everyday voices, but lack the infrastructure to really, to, to allow that to reach sort of the wider community or to represent the island in a larger way. And so it's, it's really beautiful that UOG Press has created this program so that a cadre, a cohort of writers get this experience where we share with each other, we work with each other to improve our pieces, to improve our voices, and that eventually we all sort of will, will, will take that next step into publishing, into representing the island, the Chamorro people, our stories in formal ways, in books, in collected editions and so on. And so Sidus Masi to UOG Press for creating the space. And Bonito Ibinamizu Lakui Mantiktigi. It's great work, all of the writers as well, to sort of, uh, to, who, who kept writing Kept, uh, kept reading and kept supporting each other in this time. And so with that, I want us to, so Victoria, do you wanna introduce the first? Uh... Sure. Um, so, okay, it is with uh, great honor and excitement that I introduce our first uh, Menyatlu or Chetlu Megan Taidegui. Uh, Megan is currently an English teacher at Southern High School, um, but she is also a published poet um, and writer. She was part of the uh, last Fest Pack Publications Committee and has actively helped to produce beautiful anthologies of uh, Pacific literature. Half a day and welcome, Megan. Half a day, thank you for having me here. Um, okay, so I'll just begin. The Flame Tree. Every year they waited for the flame tree to blossom. The flowers were opening one by one like embers of a soft fire glowing. That day, Kika went down, uh, went down the hill to the tree and sat under its shade to avoid the yelling of her name. Fiesta was nearing and the chores were piling. Clean the chairs, wipe down the tables, cut the grass, pick up the trash, pick lemon, prep the chicken, marinate the meat, pack the coolers, come to the coconuts, kill the babui, drain its blood, too much to do. The family liked to keep it clean, everything prepped in the neat fashion that only Tata could approve of. In fact, he had started prepping months in advance, making sure that every week the grass was bush cut and the trash that the dogs collected was thrown out and the potholes were filled on the long Barranca road that led to their house on the hill. Throwing a fiesta was a family affair. 10 minutes of break, Uncle Tuan went down to the flame tree holding on to his can of Bud Light. He towered himself in front of her. Nanny, have you been here this whole time? They're looking for you up there. He took a sip of his beer. Yeah, I just needed to get away, Kika sighed. Bitterness lingered from his Uncle Ton's breath. Fiesta is tomorrow, girl. You can rest after that. He extended his hand and Kika placed her petite hand in his. He lifted her up. How old are you now, Nanny? He took another sip of beer. 16, but I'll be 17 next week. We should barbecue for your birthday. What do you want Uncle Ton to bring? Nothing, I'm just gonna hang out with my friends. Come on, keep it in the family. He cheered, uh, he cheered his beer up into the air. I'm just playing, Kika forced out a chuckle. We better head up before we get in trouble. Uh, trouble. You go on up, I'm gonna take my break here too. He finished his beer as he watched Kika walk uphill. Viva San Francisco, Viva San Francisco, Viva San Francisco. 
Sansa shouted happily before the sun rose, waking up the house before the gods who could try. Hika wiped the munga out of her eyes and wished it were next week. But she stretched her and smiled, thinking about Austin. It was going to be the first time her boyfriend would meet her family. There is nothing that will ruin this day. My love, my life, my soul. Kiko wore the brightest smile she had that matched the sun and began preparing for the day. Kika, her mother called. Kika! Her, she rushed to her mom who was uh, de-gutting Palaxia and the Tulai. I need you to go to the store and buy ice, 10 bags. Can someone else go? I'm dishing the Keliquins. Kika volunteered for this job so that she had an excuse to chest at the food. You go and do it because you're better with money than your brothers. Why don't you take one of your cousins? The house was scattered with cousins and relatives running in and out of the entranceway, making sure the place was clean and that the food was ready for the table. But at eight in the morning, the help was slow. Does anyone want to go to the store? Younger cousins came volunteering until they found out that they had to carry ice while the older ones claimed they didn't shower yet. I'll go with you, Nen, Uncle Tun offered himself. We can take my truck. Anyone else want to go, she asked, but kept, uh, but feet kept shuffling away. She turned to Uncle Tun. Let me go and get some money, then we can go. I'll take care of it. Don't worry. Kika got into the white pickup and fastened her seatbelt. Uncle Tun started the truck and they left down the winding hill. She patiently minded the small talk until they got to the store. Do you want anything? No, I'm fine. Are you sure? Let Uncle Tun get you a drink. No, I'm okay. There's plenty to drink at home. The two carried bags of ice to the truck. Uncle Tun was able to carry four bags in each hand while leaving Kika with two. Kika hoisted the ice to the bed. She felt a sudden chill crawl up her spine and latch onto her neck. A bag of ice was pressed against her doggin and condensation dripped down her legs. A little help here, the ice bags were slipping out of his hands. She helped him taking two bags away from his hands and placing them in the truck. She fin he finished placing the rest of the bags and they left. When they arrived home, Kika's lips grinned in excitement. Austin's Jeep was parked outside her bedroom window. You know whose Jeep that is? My boyfriend, she blushed. Boyfriend, when did you have a boyfriend? Since school started. I invited him to come meet the family. Does your dad know? Yeah, and he likes him. Rouge invaded her face. His name's Austin. From where? Malasu. What's his last name? But as soon as the truck was put in park, Kika got out as quickly as she could and walked to him, dressed in khaki shorts and their class t-shirt that she bought for him last fundraiser. He kissed her cheeks and Kika felt like she was a flower in bloom. Uncle Tun walked towards the garage holding five bags in each hand. He dropped them on the garage floor, breaking the blocks into smaller chunks. So you're the boyfriend, Uncle Tun smirked and snuck out his hand, stuck out his hand. Austin gingerly took out his hand, shook his hand, and as the man looked him in the eye. I'm Uncle Tun, he gripped just quietly, squeezing Austin's hand with a bit of pressure. He puffed his chest, pulling Austin in for a side hug and thumped him on the back. Kika sent Austin to the back where her brothers were and where her brothers and the men gathered to barbecue. Austin was already friends with John John, Kika's older brother from school. They were the same grade and Kika's older brothers, Iglesias and Ramon, knew Austin's siblings, so they were inclined to like them and the reassurance from John John that he was in fact a decent Southern guy helped. The same went for her dad who knew both his parents from 19 to Naki. Kika left hurried, um, and hurried into the house where Tata was sitting down eating a fried egg and Nana was cooking hog and suni on the stove. She meninging her grandparents and washed her hands. Kika, you shouldn't be out there by yourself. I wasn't, all the guys were out there. That's not what I meant. You need to be more aware of yourself. Then Nana's voice intensified. That goes for all of you, stay together. And I will stay with you, Tata chimed. No, you go, finish your breakfast and go outside. Nana was stressed and her brittle bones were trying to keep up with the festivities. Tata chuckled, babe, I love you. He showed her peace time. Buguaitaha looked at her eyebrows furled. Siggy said, this food don't taste good. Everyone here is gonna say you cooked everything and then we'll have to cancel fiesta next year. Tata's eyes widened and without a word left the kitchen table. You, go, you girls go and change your shorts, Nana hissed, but humidity would have asked for less. Yeah, go and change, chimed the aunties who were wearing knee-length capris. For Christmas this year, you're all getting a pair of Bermuda shorts. Watch this, Cousin Isabel whispered in, K in Kika's ear. You know, there, when there's music, Auntie Chai can't resist. Isabel pressed, play, uh, pressed the play button on her phone. 
the speaker's music, uh, sorry, the speakers blared the rhythm of the guitar and the shakers and Auntie Chai began to move her hips under the boardwalk, out on the sun under the boardwalk. The cousins giggled away from the heat of the kitchen. Go and start setting the table. People are coming. More and more people flooded the property, bringing their food and drinks of chinchilla and empty stomachs. Half the village probably strolled into the fiesta by the size and weight of the line. Hika had been playing host diligently, making sure that everyone ate and drank to their stomach's content, and even occasionally washing dishes so that the load at the end of the night would not be exhausting. The aftermath of the fiesta was worse than the preparation and was always trifling when it came down to dividing the chores. Somehow Kika always had to wash dishes. Last year, she washed so many dishes, her hands burned and not even the cooler full of ice could relieve it. When it was Kika's turn to eat, she dished her plate and sat beside Austin and her brothers and her cousins. Check it out, Auntie Mummy is already packing her balutzen. Ambi, she's the balutzen queen. Dude, let's go check out the balaku tonight. Terry liked and Mary, get it girl. And they were enjoying each other's company under the pola pola. Babe, you want a drink? Austin asked Kika. Babe? Who are you calling babe here, Ramon Cassie? I'll get it. You enjoy, uh, stay here and enjoy the party. Yeah, day so spoiled. John John joined the teasing. But before she could get up, Uncle Tan came with an assortment of drinks. Anyone need one? Ugh, I hate it when he calls me Nen, Isabel declared. Me too. It's not like we're five anymore and he isn't even that old. The women of the group bantered while the guys drank their soda and beer. Ooh, I love this song. Kiko moved her shoulders. Let's dance, she dragged Austin to the dance floor where Tim Mary and Tun Wan cha cha for about a, an hour already. Cha 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 moro. The music echoed. Babe, I can't dance. Babe, it's okay. The two swayed their hips to their laughter instead of the music. When the song ended, Kiko went to the bar to get a drink where she met Isabel. You must really like him if you're dancing, she teased. I do. I'm going to tell him to meet me at the tree tonight after everyone leaves. You better hope that your brothers don't catch you. Uncle Tan Button, uh, sorry, butted in handing uh, them drinks. Don't tell them anything, Kika remarked. Em embarrassed, they walked back to their little corner of the party. The tables were cleared and the chairs were put away and exhausted and Balatsu faces were looking for the comforts of their bed. We'll let the kids pick up the trash tomorrow. The adults agreed and most of them went their separate ways. Um, most of them lived in the compound, so they walked to their homes. Has anyone seen Kika? Ramon asked. She said as she uh, she said she was going to help me put the dishes away. She mentioned that she was going to be at the tree, but I figured she wasn't. I forgot I was supposed to meet your sister at the flame tree. Austin exclaimed. I shit. Let's go and get her. She's probably freaking out. Iglesias said. Wait, let me go get the machete because the balaku trap's down there. Who cares about your balaku trap, John John? Our sister is down there. Exactly. What if she's scared? Or what if there's a snake? Let's say John John. Ramon rubbed his temples. Hurry up. The four guys walked down the hill to the flame tree with the dim flashlight and the brothers argued about who was going to fill the potholes up before they were yelled at by their dad. We'll just make Austin do it since he's, walk, uh, he's making us walk down there. And what are you going to do with our sister, huh? What if we see Ding at Doss? What if Ding at Doss sees you? Damn this stupid flashlight. The night consumed them, leaving the vultures of the night to suck their blood. Everybody shut up. Only let Austin talk so that she knows we're not here. The brothers bantered. Austin, scared for his life, was about to open his mouth and call, but then the guy saw a flash of light and heard a squeal. I told you, the balaku. The guys rushed down even faster. Under the flame tree, Kika screamed, feeling a hand touch her shoulders. She quickly turned her phone's flashlight. What are you doing here, Uncle Tun? I'm here for you, Nanny. He could, she could smell the bitterness leave his mouth. Where is he? He's not here, she sighed in disappointment. I'm just going to head back up. Wait, he grabbed her arm and pinned her against the tree, dropping her phone. She could trace the outline of his body with the little light that peered through the branches. Terrified, she let out another scream. She could feel his heat of his breath cool her neck and the nudge between her thighs. Let Uncle Tun be here for you. His free hand traveled down the, her temples to, the, to her face, to her chest, and her tears flowed down the same path. Kika tried to scream, but nothing escaped her mouth. It's okay, Nanny. I'm not going to tell. Kika, her brothers exclaimed. Kika, 
The fear of her brothers outran Austin and a rage of passion filled their bodies as the moon outlined their silhouettes. Kika began to well. Whoosh, the machete swung in the air. Whoosh, the machete blade hit the trunk of the tree. Whoosh, the machete was out of his hand. Kika move out of the way. Stop it, stop it. Their bodies entangled with another, sweat and tears and blood glinting like stars in the darkness. Their harsh screams turn on some lights in the family compound. Go on call dad, one of the brothers fled. Cars, car lights came rushing down. The next morning, the flame tree was covered from branch to branch in thick succulent red blossoms. Each day, the red intensified on the day, and on the day of the funeral, the tree looked as if it were on fire, burning the memories of a family affair. Okay. Sorry, I know it was pretty long. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. And so next in terms of our writers today, I'm, I'm happy to introduce uh, Joseph Titano, Joe Titano. He's a government reporter at the Pacific Daily News. He writes about the absurdity of modern life in paradise. And so Sidus Masi, Joe, whenever you're ready to share your piece. Uh, buenas, thanks so much for having me today. Uh, I wish I had a really fun, exciting poem to read. Uh, I also wish this one had a title, uh, but it doesn't. So here is notebook page 15. Check this out, he says, knee deep in a jumble of plastic containers, waving around an iron from the last century, rusted and waiting for a batch of hot coals. Why would you keep that old junk, I asked. It was your grandmother's, he says, filing it away on the shelf using some mysterious sorting system he keeps in his head. This old house, these old things, the cumulative shit of three generations of an extended pack rat tree, microwave in the afternoon heat in a 10 by 20 container painted aqua green. The makeshift shed we offloaded from a steamer and planted in our yard before Pong Song Wa. We could use this, he says, rolling up some old RCA cables, pig tailed extension cords, shuffling an assortment of fasteners in a metal bin. Excitedly, he jingles the spare key for a Miata we gave up years ago, like the ghost of the car is out there somewhere, waiting. I can't tell if he's just been outpaced by the exponential growth of things, still running on a calendar from another millennium where surplus must be stored for future necessity, where garbage must be piled up high, lest its potential be wasted. He does his sorting dutifully, blissful and unaware of the pace of change, the grinding obsolescence of the digital clock. Here is the chewed up generator, an Apple computer from the 90s, someone's old teddy bear, a photo of a woman I've never met, tinted in the natural sepia of aging film. These belong to your cousin, he says, gesturing with one hand. It occurs to me that one day, not too far on the horizon, no one will be able to remember who any of this crap belongs to. No one on this property, certainly not me, who was conceived long after these objects meant anything to anyone. One day, no one will remember. In my mind, I see the tree of my ancestry grasping outwards slowly from some shifting unknown point of origin, chosen from the stories of my oldest relatives who placed the start of all time at the feet of the oldest, deadest person that they remembered as kids. Nostalgia becomes a beginning for them, for me. That first memory of love, washed in the blood of time, becomes a sacred site where the seed of my tree was planted by brown folks rolling around giddily in the grass. And from there, it sprung up and out and around, blooming in the evening dew, spreading my family like flowers in the wind. My old helmet, Bob grins back in the container, hoisting up the olive drab bucket that carried him through the infantry, beaming with the pride of a serviceman. Somewhere in the distance, there's the sound of a backhoe, far down the freshly laid gravel roads, carved like wounds into the Antigua village, smashing down a jungle full of things whose names I'll never learn to say, making room for non-homes in a non-place, a smiling gated boneyard to be filled with people who will never stop to live 
as they pass through here like spirits. Here, take this, he says, handing me the wrench we came for in the first place and jumping off the back end of the container. And maybe I start to realize it is not just hunger in times of austerity and the memory of Itempu and Guerra and their blood that drives these pack rats I come from, but a gnawing sentimentality, a demand at all times that you must not forget. We go to the edge of the property, to the wreck of my Nino's old home and finish dismantling the only thing left standing of him. There is a dream I have about it sometimes, a memory of the storm. And if the house is still there, its purple clapboard slick and glittering in the rain. Above me, there's the roaring of Pong Song Wa, the roiling gray maw of the sky. I climb up the front steps, freezing in the wind, throw open the door and fall through the splintered wooden floor into the dark. And when I wake, it's still raining. Water from the sky is pounding against the tin of my roof. Then I pray that the wind does not come back and the thunder and the rain to wash our lives, every trace of us away, like old letters in a stream. Yeah, that's it. Viva! Wow, Joe, that was awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, looks like you have a fun notebook there. <laughs> so great. Um, next, we have. Uh, I'm a uh, Chetlu from my writing group uh, and someone that I have long admired uh, for his storytelling abilities. Uh, Key Siswiko oh. is a self-taught uh, graphic artist from Hoggett. Uh, he is the co-chair of Independent Guahan's Art Reach Committee. Um, he's also one of the co-founders of the Senegonta Youth Poetry Movement um, that really birthed a lot of amazing writers and writing and expression in our community. So it is a great honor to welcome and introduce our next writer, Ki Sisuiku. Alkadi, thanks for the intro. Uh, I um, so this is something I'm still working on. It's titled, Inat Ma'atnyo. The Harlem Tana was as black as Aga feathers without her hat in. Her big brown eyes frantically searched the darkness for anything familiar, but she couldn't see past her outstretched hand. Still, her feet shot forward blindly as she charged through the Harlem Tana. The menacing silhouettes of trees rushed towards her like ghosts their branches clawing and poking at her arms and face. She couldn't stop. Not when she slammed her toes or cut her soles on rocks, banged her shins on nunu roots or lost her balance when buying snakes around her feet. She had to warn the village. She wanted to call out to her friends but was afraid the Nama Anya would hear her. She didn't know what exactly it was except that it looked like an immense and shapeless cloud of smoke that was dark blue like deep ocean. It rose ominously from the jungle, towering over her and her friends as they were at the Hagoi. Flashes of white light streaked through the Namaatya like lightning. They immediately took off running towards their village, but got separated when one by one their torches were knocked from their hands by branches. She listened for them, but her ears were filled with her rapid breathing and the disorienting cacophony coming from everywhere of leaves rustling, trees creaking, branches rubbing together, and a tutu shell scraping across rocks. Suddenly, from somewhere behind her, there was a loud rumble followed by an explosion that seemed to be heading her way. It got louder and more terrifying the closer it got. The ground began trembling. She knew it was dangerously close. She picked up her pace. Soon she was engulfed by the deafening sound of trees snapping and rocks shattering. She turned to see what looked like a deadly flash flood barreling through the Holland Tunnel towards her, but she knew it was something far worse. Time slowed down for a split second, just enough for her to see two blood red eyes locked on her from behind the shadowy chaos. The malevolence in those eyes was chilling. She began sprinting at superhuman speed, or it felt that way, yet the Nama Anya was right behind her. She winced as her back and leg were pelted by the wood and rock shrapnel that rained down around her, but she did not stop. She could feel the warm rush of air that preceded this nightmare. 
It made her long, dark hair flow in front of her like the wind's shadow. Death seemed inevitable. Just as Natma Anya roared and lunged at her, she screamed and shot up from her sleep, panting, eyes scanning the room. She was safe in her bed, but couldn't stop shaking with fear and anger. The dream felt so real. She asked, shielding her face with her hands. That's it. Thank you. Ooh, si dus masi, si dus masi zabi. Sto, sto hagas nai zazahu nai ipin in pop musia lo zahu lo kui fin get mo. I mean, I mean, I've I've liked I've liked I've liked your art for a long time, and I'm and I'm really loving the that you're expanding into writing. Si dus masi. So i i otro set musa gi esti karera antipigi. Johanna Salinas, poetry lover. She works in GDOE as a teacher. You can ask her about her adventures on the front line of teaching middle school. Um, and so, and I'm I'm so excited for the day when Johanna Salinas publishes the first ever Chamorro Chiclet book. So I hope that she'll be sharing some of the Chamorro Chiclet with us today. Sidus Masi Johanna. Off a day, sir. So yes, thank you for the kind words. And I'd like to say congratulations to all the graduates this year. I've been seeing all their colorful cars on the road and I'm like, wow, so pretty. Okay, so um, I'm gonna be sharing some heartwarming pieces. I know I usually uh, sh share some angry stuff, but then I'm like, you know what? The world is already hurting too much. It's time to just share something inspirational-ish. I hope I inspire you. If not, it's okay. Okay, so the first one is called, Don't Be Afraid to Feel Too Much. In a poem you wrote about yourself, you lamented your appreciation for anime, your dream to make everyone smile, and your Chamoru determination for a Gofunita Gohan. You reminded me to love and to take love and to be love. You don't see loving as a chore or a societal obligation because you're not afraid to be hurt. You reminded me being hurt is a part of being alive. And though it sometimes feels like the world doesn't love you back, I want you to know that you're more than just anxiety and self-doubt bundled up in a big yellow sweater. You're a field of sunflowers blooming bright for this cruel, cruel world. The cruelness is like winter shadow wanting you to wither away, saying you're too emotional, too weak to exist. But you must live your truth. You must promise to be kindness and to exhale kindness. You are the morning sun. You rise and rise and rise in the sky. You see that where there is life, there is hope. If our paths were to meet, at Shine Market or Ordot Church, I want you to know that you have someone giving you hope. Okay, so uh, that's the first poem. All right, so the second poem, it's kind of like inspired by online working and um, just being burnt out from the pandemic and like not really uh, feeling connected to people anymore or like you know like now that things are easing on our island it's like like we kind of forget how to be social so this one is called girl stop pretending you're tired and get in the kitchen as specific daughters we are nurturers of the land of the culture we are the ones in the kitchen before and after the fandangos we are the voice leading the novena to amen and yet you've been locking yourself in your room, watching BTS fan edits and dreamy anime, waiting for the table to be blessed before slipping back into existence. You descend from a long constellation of Chimoru chanters and Zumba dancers, but I know sometimes you don't want to be the perfect Pacific daughter. The honor for the Tautamona and the loyalty to your family is burning a hole in your sky. 
I want you to know that loving yourself is a part of being Chamoru and it's okay to be a three dimensional character with layers and emotion instead of the cliche noble savage whose only purpose is to serve a story too messy for anyone to comprehend. It's okay to disappear and be sad sometimes. Just remember that when you return to the Chalakitas and Calamansi Laminata, home is always waiting for you to add flavor. Okay, so I think I have time for one more. I promised only three pages. So it is mango season. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and share a mango poem while I drink my mango smoothie. This one is called Dr. Matilda Napati Rivera. And don't worry, I got her permission. Okay. In our last video call, I wanted to show you a flyer I made for Blue 10 and do our monthly check-ins. I told you about my discovery of canned boba tea and asked if you've heard anyone talk crap about me lately. You told me about your babies, how your oldest is taking a break from her job and your younger two are getting too comfortable with their distance learning. I told you about my new marriage to Gov Guam and scattering my dreams into the Tossie. I told you I'm okay with not being important and that as Americans, it's normal to feel unhappy and unfulfilled. You told me to stop playing the victim and be proud of all I've done, though I know I've never really done anything. Oh, how I miss you and your mango stories, how you'd share payless bags full of real fruit you claim is from your yard. When the pandemic ends, Please remind me of our island, our truth, our harmony. You are carnival food, more fun, more colorful than any five-star buffet. Dinner with you is always better under the stars, more so beside the Tossie after a long day of volunteering. The world makes me feel old, but you still call me your poetry nanny. Peace out. <laughs> Ah, Viva Poetry Nanny. <laughs> that was really awesome. You had a lot of awesome lines. Thank you, Johanna. Um, our next author uh, is, she does a lot of really fun and great things in our community. Uh, Kohaku Flynn is an adjunct instructor at the University of Guam. She runs the Rotor Act Club of the Medianas with an incredible team and hosts a radio show called Indico Hour at KPRG on uh, station 89.3. I've got to check that out. Um, so uh, half a day and welcome to Kohaku. Half a day, everyone. Good evening. Um, so I was going to share um, some excerpts from my book that I'm currently working on, it's based on my grandmother's letters, but um, I kind of want to switch gears and I'd like to share two short poems, um, short and sweet. They aren't as fun as Johanna's. Uh, these are sort of darker, but you know, just trying to mix it up. Um, so this first one is about, um, I wrote this one after, a, um, after reading a book about a shipwreck in the Pacific Ocean. Um, so they both center on uh, animals. So the first one is called Hagen. Crimson polyps bubble to the surface, like when green sea turtles come up for air, but are unsuspectingly heaved by shell onto a life raft. Three gaunt children gather round bend to kiss its leathery neck and slit its carotid with their only dull blade. Merlot splurts, pulsating out rhythmically to a heart that continues to beat. The children drink greedily, smack their lips and smile, red teeth with a belly full of warm blood. They can see themselves in the turtle's black eyes, so they flex and hang strips of turtle meat on the dinghy's sad mast while hungry fish peck at the underside, waiting to be let in. Really upbeat. 
Okay, so the next one is short and sweet again. Uh, this one is called Duk Duk. The time has come to scuttle back to my safe haven. I have wandered much too far and I cannot find my way. Dodge the enormous orange cloth, tickle across a pasty soft mass, climb a castle built for kings to find myself home again. Only some nasty fellow has sealed the duct with a wave of his hand has sealed it shut. Thank you. Ooh. Oh, Sejus Masi. Sejus Masi Kohaku for that. I love that. I like the, the, the Duk Duk one, although the other one was very vivid too. But as you said, very upbeat. The <laughs> but Sejus Masi for that. All right. We are now getting to our last reader for today. I'm happy to introduce Magotuna, uh, introduce Yamzu as Edward Akfodzi Jr. He's currently an undergraduate student at UOG, working towards a Bachelor of Arts in English and also dual minoring in writing and Chamorro studies. He aspires to become a future educator, teaching young minds what stories our island has to offer. Viva, bonito, and now. And so, Eddie, Sejus Masi, put for what? I saw the lineup and I was, I'm very, very furious that I have to go last after all of you <laughs> talented, talented people. I am literally, I've been like praising you all. I love you all. I love all of your works. I'm so um, happy and um, it's a great pleasure to be here. And thank you so much for this opportunity. Whew, okay, got to shake off the nerves. Okay, this is, um, I'm going to be sharing my piece, um, Golai Hagu Sudi. Um, so uh, just a little disclaimer about this piece. I think that we have time to like, for me to read it in entirely. So I really like this piece. Um, uh, so this came at a time when um, I was taking the first dosage of the vaccine. So I feel like this piece really came out of um, our, the pandemic and the quarantine and everything. Um, it came at a time when I accidentally ate some bad Hagusuni, Hagunsuni. Um, this piece has me saying Hagusuni now, but I ate some bad Hagunsuni and I just, I just had a terrible reaction and I thought it, would, it was either uh, the immune response or um, just like food poisoning. So I'm glad something good came out of this experience. So yeah, here is Golai Hagusuni. Intro. Hi everyone, Guahusi Bernadette Dunka and welcome to my online e-cookbook recipe archive. This right here is my favorite Chamorro dish. This meal is for all you tomorrow vegetarians and vegans who can afford the veggies but can't afford your mother's disappointment in cooking a meal all day. As a devout vegetarian, it's so difficult to find vegetarian meals in tomorrow culture, especially when you want to respect your elders. Golai Hagusuni is one of those few exceptions. I remember making this dish every time my sisters and girlfriends and I had some serious breakups. We would stop by each other's houses and cook each other this exact meal. Uh, we would, um, okay. The recipe has been passed down generations from my family line, but it managed to find its way to my closest friends. I hope this helps you as much as it's helped me. Smiley face. Ingredients. Spinach. In parentheses, bake it till you'll make it. Coconut milk. Turmeric. Um, or turmeric. Chopped onions, chopped garlic, lemon powder, salt, doni pepper. Extraneous supplies. Cutting board. Two large bowls and pots. Knives. Sunni tree plant. Shovel. Cyanide. Prepare the following overnight. Mix salt, lemon powder, and turmeric. Chop the garlic, chop the onions, chop the spinach, chop the doni. Chug the coconut milk. Consume chopped garlic, onions, and spinach gradually. Gradually add salt mix. Slip three drops of cyanide through your lips and enter your system. Feel the cold ingredients, even the spicy cold of the pepper as it goes down. It's important you feel it go down. Kiss the kids goodnight. Invite your sisters over. Let them take you to the downstairs bathroom into the bathtub. If you don't have a bathtub, an igloo cooler works just fine. Fill it up with ice. The ice will eventually melt, so cold water will do just fine. But the ice is recommended. In parentheses, you are a meal. Ease into the ice. You must be heating up mad. Your mad fever could get you into hysterics. It's important you have your loved ones around you, so you go through it all together. In about two hours of a full frenzy of spasming out of control, cracking tiles, 
and maybe even injuring your own friends, you should be readily unconscious. The process has just begun. Lie back into the ice and let it fully settle into your lungs. Your friends should hug you to help marinate, helping um, everything go in, going on inside you. After about two more hours, your fellow chef should be able to check on the color of your skin as it matures to, into a subtle yellow. In a half hour more, it should be a full green. You are ready to be packaged. Let your friends take the head, your feelings, emotions, anger away. Let yourself go. Let it sink in. You will need to go to your backyard and have your friends dig using a shovel, a hole both the size of a matured tarot tree and the size of your body, in parentheses, also mature. I forgot to ask, um, are we allowed to curse? Yes. Thank you. They will settle your thoughtless body into the earth and cover you up from sight. They will help you settle yourself. They will help ground you. Let them. It is time. Eventually, it comes time to plant the, Lenny, the little Nenny Sun plant. After digging the plant, go back inside to finish preparing the head. The head should have already begun starting to wilt from top to bottom. Its green color is already sh the shade of a spinach or a suni leaf. Layer by layer of skin is peeled off, paper thin. Gather every slice of your head into any container, cool whip, lemon powder, etc. As long as it helps you to bring your thoughts together, let your thoughts marinate overnight. Directions, wake up. Wake up and some, rise to meet the day. Dig yourself out of the earth to find a new head on your shoulders. Go wash off. Wake up your kids. Remind yourself you still have a recipe to finish. Take out your head of prepared suni leaves or spinach left in the icebox. Rinse the leaves, fresh leaves in the sink. Observe how they look exactly like a suni leaf, a green heart. Remember that cooking is an act of love. Get the kids to school. Then you can properly finish the rest of the recipe. Eat every leaf. Digest all of what happened the previous night. Take your time. Use the restroom. Shit into any container. Cool whip, lemon powder, etc. The marination you prepared inside you should have easily mixed into a full meal. Find him. Get David, that lying, cheating, scumbag motherfucker. Get the kids. F Let Francesca pick them up from school. Tell her your sister to bring them to her house and tell them, your kids, to spend the night with their cousins. Tell them, mommy is going to cook your favorite meal while daddy tastes it. David works at a corporate law firm in the upper side of Sumon, right before the medical district. There he meets with that doctor to fuck behind your back every Wednesday. It is Wednesday today, you remember. Go to her work, ask for her name. Hello, I'm here to see Dr. Harper. I have an appointment at 12, politely ask. Yes, I'll go ahead and check in if she's in now. She went into the wrong room. Oh, okay, I'll go in. I'm gonna go ahead and use the restroom. You don't need the restroom. Go straight to the restroom. Go straight to the room that PI, your sister's recommended, gave you the footage of. His flat ass in her jeans, a back tattoo of Nirvana in the imprint and the imprint of your fucking wedding ring in his tattered and stained back pocket. Second door on the right, pull your phone out, kick it down, record a sick ass. David, don't even bother. Meet me at my house. I'm sending this to your fucking mother. Rush home, get out your church clothes, a gorgeous black blouse and a long flowing dress, floral printed purples, violets, reds, and fuchsias like a Baroque painting. You act like a funeral, you act like you just died. No, you were just reborn. Sit down, cross your arms, cross your legs, get out the document. Watch as he pulls into the driveway, knowing what he had to pull out of to get to here. Tell him to sit down, break out the hagusuni. Tell him you've had enough. Tell him, I'm tired of trying to express myself to you. I'm nev I am never wanted to talk about this. I never, I want nothing from you. I want nothing from you in the kid's life. Not Missy or Mika or Michael. I just need two things from you right now. Sign this and eat this. Don't tell him you left your hagusuni out in the sun. Let him go free through the night. You should know what you did to him. Leaving it out and is sure to give him food poisoning. He's going to puke and shit constantly. He's going to go on a liquid diet and soon that he, soon that's all he's going to puke and shit. Just liquid green and yellow, heart from lemon lime Gatorade for electrolytes, but mostly because of what's going on inside him. The stomach pains, the belief he's going to die by morning, fevering so hard he cries smoke. You should tell him he's feeling everything you felt he feels. How fucking dare you do this to me, to our kids, to our family? How am, I, am I not enough to you? What does she have that I don't? What the fuck do I have to do to get some fucking respect? I hope you die, I hope you rot, I hope your corpse fucking smells and stinks and decomposes under the sun. Oh, shoot. Um, I'm so sorry. Okay. Um, this took a turn uh, to get some... I hope you feel it as your body melts away into a hot soup. I go the fuck to hell. My sisters are right about you. You should know two things. He either dies tonight or he survives your feelings and lives on to live a 
long and happy life with his new fuck buddy, Dr. Harper, who he switches out every five years. He lives on to feel the pains of your hurt. He grows old with the pain he's causing, caused you. You must get ready for his funeral. You need to get close to his family and demand the closed casket. You will find him in his coffin, a hot, soupy, agin suni corpse, ready to be served at the fiesta table. Let that motherfucker cook. Feel free to help out the caterers. Be sure to pour yourself a cup of him. You need to know that even if he survives right now, he takes what he did to you to his grave. Serve your leftover Hagasuni around, or make sure it's a blue tent. And enjoy your new Suni tree outro. Well, there you have it. That's my Hagasuni recipe. I sincerely hope you enjoy it as much as I have. Dos Masi. Wow. <laughs> I swear, I'm, I'm really lucky to be in the same writing group with Eddie and to say that I have are, have read this piece in its entirety. And since then, I have not been able to look at Gole Hagen Suni, even look at it again. <laughs> like, I went to like a small little gathering and my husband was eating Gole Hagen Suni and I was like, oh, I can't. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> I will. <laughs> um, but thank you to Eddie and to all of our, our writers for sharing tonight um, and to all the other writers in our group groups that uh, inspire us and that we work alongside on these beautiful pieces with. Um, I definitely couldn't have survived the last year without uh, this group, without the work we're doing. And I'm so excited to continue writing with all of you. Um, those of you tuned in uh, and watching, if you're interested in joining uh, our writing program at the University of Guam Press, please don't be mamala. Uh, email us, uogpress at triton.uog.edu. Also, if you're interested in taking the editing class, email that same place, uogpress at triton.uog.edu and register by June 1st. So uh, thank you again to all the writers that shared tonight and to all of you for tuning in. Until next time, esta joas. <laughs>